Islam and Modernity, Part 1 1. The Demands of the Age In the introduction to Man and His Destiny 1 in which I investigated the subject of the greatness and then decay of the Muslims, I recognized that the causes of the decline of the Muslims could be examined under three headings, Islam, the Muslims, and external influences. In that introduction, one of the 27 topics which I thought required to be studied and examined with this very topic, and I promised to publish a short book with the title, Islam and the Demands of the Age. And I had already collected a good deal of notes for it. Point two. In this series of articles, it is not possible to put all the subject matter that should be included in a book. I shall, however, explain matters to the extent that I may enlighten the minds of the respected readers on this matter. The subject of religion and progress is one of those subjects which has been brought up in other religions much more than it has been for us Muslim. Many of the world's intellectuals have abandoned religion on because they thought that religion and progress were incompatible. They entertained the idea that having a religion entailed the discontinuance and stopping of, and struggling against, movement and change. In other words they considered religion to be fixedness, a monotony and solidification of existent forms and patterns. Nehru III, the late Prime Minister of India, had anti-religious beliefs, and adhered to no tradition or religion. From his writings it transpires that the thing that he abhorred in religion was its dogmatic aspect and its quality of seeing everything in only one perspective. In his later years, Nehru felt that something was missing and wanting both in his own self and in the universe, and that this vacuum or gap could not be bridged except by a spiritual force. Despite that feeling, he was afraid of being attached to religion because of that very stagnancy and unilateral perceptiveness which, according, to him, was there in every religion. An Indian journalist, a Mr. Karunjiya IV, had an interview with Nehru towards the end of his life, and that was apparently the last occasion when Nehru gave expression to his views on general universal topics. During that interview, Karunjiya questioned him about Gandhi V, and remarked that some intellectuals and progressivists believed that Gandhi, by his perceptive solutions and idealistic and spiritual methods, had weakened and shaken Nehru's original beliefs in scientific socialism. In his reply, Nehru told him that it was necessary and good to benefit from spiritual and idealistic methods also, and that he had always believed in them as Gandhi had, and that at the time of speaking it was of great importance and all the more necessary to count on those means. The reason was that in the face of the spiritual vacuum of modern civilization it was necessary, more than before to look for spiritual and ideological answers. Karunjiya, afterwards, put some questions about Marxism and Nehru pointed out some of the shortcomings Marxism and again reverted to the way of spiritual solutions to problems. It was then that Karunjiya asked Nehru whether the statements he had just made, with their references to moral and spiritual concepts, did not display a difference from the Jawaharlal Nehru of yesterday. All his statements pointed to the idea that Nehru, in the ripening of his age, was in search of God. Nehru agreed, and said that he had indeed changed, and his insistence on the spiritual and moral values had not been without case and consideration. He pointed out that another matter was there created up, and that was how morality and idealism could be raised to a higher level. He again remarked that clearly religion existed for that purpose. But that religion had unfortunately degenerated because of its short-sightedness and its blind adherence to certain lifeless rites and rituals and to the performances of unchanging ceremonies. The outward FORM and the external shell of religion continued to exist while its spirit and real meaning had been lost. 2. Islam and the Demands of the Age Amongst all the traditions and religions, None has produced so much influence or as deep an impact on the different aspects of human life as Islam has done. In its procedures Islam is not content only with a series of acts of worship, recitations and incantations, and a collection of moral exhortations, but it also deals with the fundamental directions that relationships between human beings should take, and the rights and duties of individuals in respect of each other in various situations in the same way as it has explained the relations of men with God. So it is only natural that the question of suitability and harmony with the times should he given more attention with regard to Islam. 3. 
The nature of Islam's adaptation to demands of age from the point of view of non-Muslims. Incidentally, many non-Muslim scholars and writers have studied the social and the civil law of Islam and have spoken highly of Islamic laws as a progressive series of laws, and they have drawn attention to and commended the living character and enduring nature of this religion and its ability to adapt its laws to the advance of time. Bernard Shaw VI, the great English liberal writer said, I have always had the greatest respect for the religion of Muhammad on account of its extraordinary quality of staying lively. In my opinion, Islam is the only religion which has the ability to harmonize and exert its control over differing circumstances and changing ways of life, and to confront the diversities of the centuries. 7. Thus I predict, and already the signs can be seen, that tomorrow the faith of Muhammad will become quite accepted in Europe. 8. The theologians of the Middle Ages drew a dark picture of the religion of Muhammad, as a result of their ignorance and prejudices. Because of their malice and fanaticism, he seemed, in their eyes, to be against Christianity. I have read extensively about this man. This extraordinary man, and I have come to the conclusion not only that was he not against Christianity, but that he should he called the savior of mankind. I believe that if such a man as he was to be in charge of the present-day world, he would manage to solve the problems and difficulties of the world in such a way that he would ensure the ideal peace and happiness of humanity. 9. Dr. Shibli Shumayel, a Lebanese Arab, professes materialism. He translated the origin of the species 10 of Darwin 11 into Arabic for the first time together with the commentary of the German Buchner, 12 as an appendix, to serve as a weapon against religious beliefs, and he brought it within the reach of Arabic-speaking people. In spite of his being a materialist, he could not restrain himself from admiring and praising Islam and had no reservation about acknowledging its greatness. He always spoke highly of it as a living religion and of its ability to adapt to the times. In the second volume of his Philosophy of Evolution and Progress, Falsafatua Nashu Wal Irtika, which he published in Arabic, he wrote an article under the title The Quran and Prosperity, Al Quran Wal Umran in refutation of an article by a non-Muslim who had traveled in Islamic countries and had put the blame of the decline of the Muslims onto Islam. Dr. Shibli Shumayel diligently showed in this article that the cause of the decline of Muslims was their deviation from the social teachings of Islam and not Islam itself. He expressed his view that those sections of Westerners who attack Islam either do not understand Islam or else has malicious motives and want to make people in the East cynical towards the laws and prescriptions which, anyway, have disappeared from among them, and thus fix the yoke of subservience around their necks. In our own times, his question of whether Islam can adapt to the demands of the age is very commonly asked. I myself have come into contact with different classes of people and especially with those who are educated and well-traveled. I have found no other matter involved to such a degree in controversy. 4. Confusions They sometimes give their questions a philosophic tinge and say that everything in this world is subject to change. Nothing is immutable and fixed. Human society is not an exception to that rule, so how is it possible that a series of social laws can remain always unchanged? If we attend only to the philosophic aspect of the question, the answer is evident. A thing which is always changing is at one time new and then becomes old. It grows and then decays. It progresses and develops, just as the things of this world and its material composites. But the laws of nature are constant. The living organism, for example, has developed and is developing according to a particular law and scientists have described this law of evolution, living organisms are themselves continually undergoing change and evolving. But what about the laws of change and evolution? Of course, the laws of change and evolution do not change and do not evolve, and we mean the laws themselves. It makes no difference whether the law in question is a natural law, or a derived or man-made law because it is entirely possible for a derived or man-made law to be derived from nature and the order of things, and for that which determines the direction evolution takes to be individuals or human social groups. However, the questions that are put in connection with the adaptability or non-adaptability of Islam to the demands of the times do not only have a general or philosophic aspect. 
The question which is repeated more often than any other is that since laws are made according to needs, and since a human being's social needs are not fixed and unchanging, social laws cannot be fixed and unchanging. This one is a very good and valuable question. Incidentally, one of the miraculous aspects of the sure religion of Islam, on account of which every intelligent and sagacious Muslim has a sense of pride and honor, is the fact that Islam will regard to unchanging needs of the individual or society envisages unchanging laws, but that in the case of temporary and changing needs it conceives of a changing attitude. We shall, with the help of Allah, comment on this to the extent that this series of articles permits. 5. What does time itself conform to? However, we think it necessary to mention two things before we start discussing this matter. One of them is that most of those people who talk of progress, evolution and change in the present circumstances think that every change that takes place in social conditions, especially when it originates in the West should be counted as evolution and progress, and this is the most misleading idea that has taken hold of people today. According to these people, because the amenities and conveniences of life change day by day, because the more perfect replaces the more defective and because knowledge and technology is in a state of advancement, all the changes that take place in the life of men are a kind of progress and development and should be welcomed, for it is the momentum of time, and like it or not, it is bound to have its way. As a matter of fact, neither are all changes the direct result of knowledge and technology, nor is there any necessity or momentum at work. Although knowledge is in a state of progress, the capricious, rapacious nature of man is not idle. Knowledge and the intellect guide man towards perfection, and the capricious, gracious nature of man try to drag him towards decomposition and deviance. His capricious and rapacious nature is continually trying to turn knowledge into a tool for itself, and to make use of it for the attainment of its carnal and animal appetites. Time has within it decomposition and deviance in the tune way as it has within it progress and evolution. One should advance with the progress of time, but also struggle against decomposition and deviance of time. Both reform and reaction rise up against of time, with the difference that reform takes a stand against the corruption of time and reaction stands in the way of the progress of time. If we consider time and its changes as the final criteria of good and evil, then with what standard can we measure time itself and its changes? If everything has to adapt to time, to what is time to adapt? If man is helplessly dependent on time and its changes, what is the role of the activity, creativeness, and constructiveness of man's will? Man steps aboard the vehicle of time while the vehicle is in motion. He should not neglect the steering and control of that vehicle even for a moment. Those who talk much about the changes of time and neglect to steer and control it have forgotten the role of the effectiveness of man, and are like the rider of a horse who has put himself under the control of the horse. 6. Adaptation or Abrogation? The second point which has to be mentioned here is that some people have solved the difficulty of Islam and the demands of the times by means of a very simple and easy formula. They say that Islam is an eternal religion and is adaptable to any age and any time. But we want to know how that adaptation is to be brought about and what that formula is. They reply, once we see that the temporal circumstances have changed, we forthwith abolish the existing laws and establish other laws in their place. The writer of the Forty Proposals has solved this difficulty in the same manner. He says that the worldly laws of religion should be supple and flexible and should be in harmony and conformity with the progress of knowledge, learning and the spread of civilization. And such mildness, flexibility, and adaptability with the demands of time are not only against the lofty teachings of Islam, but are exactly in conformity with its spirit. Zaniras, number 90, page 75. The said author writes before and after the above sentences that because the demands of the times undergo change, because every age demands new laws, and because the civil and social laws of Islam are in accord with the simple life of the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah, age of ignorance, pre-Islamic times, and are frequently the actual customs and traditions of pre-Islamic Arabs and do not conform with the present age. It is necessary that other laws should be passed today in place of these laws. People with such views should be asked how it is that if the meaning of the conformability of a law with the exigencies of a particular age is its capacity for abrogation, this law does not have that suppleness and flexibility, 
why is this law not conformable to a particular age? This justification of the suppleness and adaptability of Islam to the times can be compared to a man who says that books and a library are the best source of pleasures in life. When he is asked to explain himself he says because any time he wants to enjoy himself a man can immediately sell the books and spend the money, thus acquired, on having a good time. This author says that the teachings of Islam are of three kinds. The first kind are the principles of belief, such as belief in Tawhid, the oneness of God, the resurrection, etc. The second kind consists of worship, such as the preparation and performance of prayer, fasting, purification, cleanliness, and the Hajj, pilgrimage to Mecca, etc. And the third kind consists of the laws, which are relevant to people's lives. The first and the second kinds are a part of religion, and the things which the people should always observe are these very matters. But the third kind is not a part of religion. Because religion does not have anything to do with people's lives, and the Prophet did not bring these laws on the grounds that they were a part of religion and related to the obligations of the message. But, since the Prophet was, the incidentally, the man in charge, he had to deal with these matters also. Otherwise, the function of religion is only to lead people to worship, prayer, and fasting. What does religion go to do with the life of this world? I cannot imagine that someone can live in an Islamic country and be so ignorant of the rationale of Islam. Has the Quran not stated the purpose of sending the prophets and messengers? Has the Quran not most explicitly stated? Indeed, we sent our messengers with the clear signs and we sent down with them the book and the balance so that men might uphold justice. 57, 25, the Quran mentions social justice as a fundamental aim of all prophets. If someone does not wish to act according to the Quran, why should he commit a bigger sin and denigrate Islam and the Quran? Most of the misfortunes that have befallen men these days are for this very reason that men have given up the unique support and backing of the very ethics and laws which constitute religion for about 50 years. We have been listening to the song that Islam is quite all right provided it is limited to the mosques and places of worship and does not concern itself with social matters. This song was composed beyond the borders of the Islamic countries, but has been broadcasted in all of them. Let me explain this sentence in an easier language so that I can point out the real purpose of the original composers. The real meaning, briefly, is that as long as Islam stands in the way of and holds back communism it should exist. But when it has an effect on and clashes with the interests of the West it should cease to exist. Point 13 The prescribed worship of Islam, the view of Westerners, should remain, so that when necessity arises people may be aroused against communism on the excuse of its being an atheistic, ungodly system. However, the social laws must go, because they are the philosophy of life of Muslim people and because of them Muslims have a feeling of independence and individuality in face of the people of the West, and become difficult to digest in the West's voracious appetite. Unfortunately, those who originated this idea are victims to a great misunderstanding. Firstly, it is now 14 centuries since the Quran discredited those who said, We believe in some of it and disbelieve in some. For, colon 150, it has announced that dividing up the prescriptions of Islam is unacceptable. Secondly, I think that the time has now come for Muslims to refuse to be taken in by these deceptions. The critical sense of the people has been more or less awakened. And gradually, they will begin to discriminate between the appearance of progress and development, which is the product of the power of human knowledge and thought on the one hand, and, and the appearance of corruption and decay on the other, irrespective of whether it originates in the West or not. The people of Islamic countries have more than before realized the value of Islamic teachings and have appreciated what a unique, self-sufficient philosophy of life Islam and its prescriptions represent, and they will at no cost abandon it. Muslims have realized that the propaganda campaign against Islamic laws is nothing but a colonial ruse. Thirdly, those who initiated this idea should know that Islam, when in power, can confront any atheistic or non-atheistic system and is able to govern a society with a philosophy of life. And it does not need confine itself to mosques and places of worship. If they wish Islam to be imprisoned in places of worship and thus clear the ground for Western ways of thought, there is every likelihood of the ground being cleared for other ideologies that are against the Western way of thinking. 
The fact that the West is today being attacked in some Islamic countries is the fruit of this very mistake.